to the talk here, I would say to exchange. Uh, but I think I should thank Sahil. Sahil is a member of the CTBT youth group. And uh, when I was invited to come, uh, people were, my staff were wondering if I should, uh, you know, due to my busy schedule, and then they were wondering if uh, there were not uh, other more important things to do. And then I told them that uh, when uh, it's about young people, uh, it's a priority for me. So Sahil, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for keeping me young, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here to exchange with uh, bright young people who often uh, help us put into perspective what the CTBT should and can be in this uh, current geopolitical context. So, this is just to say that it's a real honor to be here. And then I see familiar faces, uh, not only familiar faces, but experts in this field, to a point that uh, often when I talk, I thought I would talk only with young people and then I can draft them into the way I think. But I see there's so many experts here that uh, you know, I'm wondering what I can tell them. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, let's try. But uh, if you put yourself in the young man's mind, or young woman's mind, so we'll be able to understand each other, because that's what I'm doing for uh, a couple of years. So the good thing is that uh, having breakfast with a, a group of uh, uh, the younger people helped me understand that uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to bring scientists and policy makers uh, to work. When I was asking questions just now, uh, what brought you into this field? Uh, because you rightly said that uh, I came into this field because I was forced to do uh, something rather than what I wanted to do. And you guys are lucky to choose what you want to do, and then it's easy to be passionate about what you do if you are chosen. Uh, but it's more difficult to be passionate about what you're forced to do, uh, which is my case. Uh, but thank God I've been enjoying every single day of what I've studied and every single day of my professional life. So now, as you all know, what, uh, I won't go into what brought me into the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, but what basically is a Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, uh, it's all about putting an end to nuclear testing. And putting an end to nuclear testing often, uh, it's a bit vague, and people wonder uh, how to link it to putting an end to nuclear weapon, uh, which is more, I would say, sexy. You know, when you say putting an end to nuclear weapon, it's more appealing than putting an end to nuclear testing because it's, uh, we fail and it's, we find it difficult to explain to people you know, around the world why is it important to put an end to nuclear testing. And people tend to go immediately into nuclear weapon because that's what they see. Uh, nuclear testing is difficult to feel. Difficult to feel because nuclear testing has been pushed back to history, uh, except the DPRK. No other country in this 21st century has carried nuclear test explosion. Uh, it's good, good in the sense that it's proved that the CTBT has done a great job, uh, that they turn to work uh, to show to people that nothing uh, can be done in this planet uh, with regard to nuclear test explosion without being detected by the international monitoring system and the verification regime in the build-up. But it's also difficult because it's uh, so far in history for younger people like yourself that when we talk about CTBT, you find it hard to grab something tangible that you can take around to fight for, for this treaty to enter into force. And that's why uh, the youth group is so great and so important. Uh, if you tell me why I even started the youth group, uh, sometimes the easiest way to say because I was, uh, I was trying to not feel old. Uh, but that's not, that's not the reason. The reason was that uh, in uh, talking around, and especially in Hiroshima, uh, at the Middlesbrough Institute and at Stanford Exchange with people, I said, look, uh, why don't we get those young people to be engaged in what we do, for them to help us not understand what uh, the world of non-proliferation and disarmament is all about, and how CTBT fits into it, and how best they can take the CTBT forward, and then making sure that this issue that is long due finds a solution. And I think that's what we achieved. Uh, and that's what brought me here. And that's why uh, being not far from DPRK in itself, it's good. 
It's good because uh, uh, I was in Burkina three days ago when I told them I'm going to Korea. Uh, the first thing they say, okay, say hi to Kim Jong Un. Uh, because they think that Korea, it's all about North Korea, because that's what they hear. And uh, that's what people are talking about. But it's good because it helps me, uh, when I go back, to put things into a better understanding about uh, why, uh, when you are in South Korea, you're not in North Korea. Because you guys, when I say, I was talking to the young people, I say, you're lucky. You're lucky because you have the opportunity to understand the world faster than those who are my part of the world. And uh, it's not that easy. Uh, when I'm in Burkina Faso, when I'm interviewed by uh, a journalist, uh, some people hardly understand the difference between the IEA and the CTBT. They think that there's a director general of the IEA, and then there's an executive secretary of the IEA. So it's not easy. So you are lucky to be in a field, to be in an environment where uh, this difference is that easy for you. And uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, exchanging with the fellow Kenyan and uh, and uh, and Ugandan. Uh, I was telling them how blessed they are uh, to have an opportunity because life is all about opportunity. An opportunity in this particular case to have this linkage between science and diplomacy. And uh, I think there was one young Korean who was telling me just now that, you know, I'm not in the policy field. I'm an engineer. And then I thank my partner to have helped me to work and then understand things. Because that's what this is all about. Science drives policy. And uh, we're getting now in a world where uh, policy makers will soon, or are understanding that without getting scientists around them, uh, it's difficult for them to make a case for what they want to achieve with regard to policy making. And then uh, scientists also will soon realize that if they don't get closer to the policy makers, if they don't run and make case all the time with regard to issues that they deal with on a daily basis, they won't be able to make a difference. They will remain in their science and technology environment and do fundamental research, fundamental studies that will not have an impact in society or societal impact. And that's what the CTBT is trying to achieve and that's what I found in this comprehensive test on treaty and this organization that is so fulfilling. And so, and that's why I'm so passionate about what I do. Uh, when you say that I wanted to be a lawyer, don't you find that I found my place? I finally, I'm finally a lawyer. <laughs> because I'm a scientist, but now I'm advocating for a treaty to enter into force. So God basically helped me to be what I wanted to do. By being forced to do something in the scientific field, I'm now advocating for the CTVT. I'm using science to drive policy, and I'm using science to be an advocate for a treaty that is so important for the international community. So I wish you guys, those who are scientists and those who are policy makers, or those who aspire to be better scientists or better policy makers, to understand that those two are interlinked. And the best way to do best and good for the world is to make sure we connect those two the best possible. And that's what you guys are doing. And you have to do it to make a difference in your own country. You have to do it to make a difference for the international community. And you have to do it because you're young, you're bright, you have great ideas, and then you have the great and wonderful opportunity to meet with experts in their field who can share their knowledge and expertise with you. And not everyone can do that. Not everyone has an opportunity to do that. I mean, you have people who have been in this field for so many years, who have done research, who have done work, and then you're able to talk. If you talk to them for only 10 minutes, you don't, and you will never realize how those 10 minutes will be in your life. And that's what I've seen, and that's what I've done, and that's why I'm where I am. And I think you guys should work in making sure you take every single opportunity the best possible. And those opportunities will help you make a difference. Difference for yourself in Malaysia, difference for yourself in Indonesia, and difference for yourself in Korea here, because you will be able to get North and South to meet, and North and South to work together for peace, regional peace, and international peace. So what this leads me to is the optimism that you probably see in my face, even if I look tired this morning. And uh, that optimism comes from Dr. the younger people. Dr. arrived last night, 2 a.m. <laughs> this morning, 2 a.m., you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so, um, so who did? Yeah, I was talking to 
a fellow from Georgia Tech. He said, okay, I met one of your students. He meant Sahil. Uh, it's true, I met Sahil, uh, Sahil, you were 15 or 16 when you came at uh, uh, 18. No, you look 15 anyway. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Sahil came at uh, one of our science and technology conference uh, with uh, uh, Secretary Perry and uh, Deborah Gordon from Stanford. And uh, uh, he had a wonderful performance at stage. And people, I mean, you like it because we thought you were 15. That's why we saw, you know, we thought that you were so great. You know, had we known that you were 18, we wouldn't say this. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Said has such a great performance that people were so impressed. But they were impressed about uh, the, eight, the 15 years old boy. But uh, now I realize you are 18, I'm going to change that, Said. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Said came and then uh, uh, joined the youth group. And then he's uh, one of the driving force behind the CTBT youth group. And then helping to make a difference for this treaty and also helping to link people from different countries. And uh, Sahil will tell you that we have more Indian and Pakistani in the CTBT youth group than any other nationality. We have 75 uh, different nationalities at the CTBT. And people ask me why. Why India and Pakistan, those two countries haven't ratified or signed the CTBT? Why young people from those two countries are so enthusiastic about the CTBT? My answer to that is a bit, uh, I mean, what I say is, at this age, they do what they're told not to do. Uh, Sahil, am I right? Uh, I think in India, when they're told in India, don't go to CTBT, don't touch CTBT, or they say in Pakistan, don't touch CTBT, people want to know at this age, why our government, uh, uh, why the Indian and the Pakistani government don't want the CTBT to be a topic? And then they go and search. And they're making a difference for us. Uh, today, India is an observer to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. No, not India. Pakistan is an observer to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And we're hoping that with this in younger generation, that they will make a difference to a point where they will bring those who negotiated the treaty, who was part of the CTBT negotiation, to join as an observer, to understand what we've achieved so far and what we can do with this treaty. And that leads me to the next point, which is the Ban Treaty. Yesterday, I was asked by a journalist, uh, what do I think about the Japanese government not uh, signing or ratifying the Ban Treaty? A difficult question. And uh, at the Peace Memorial yesterday, I mean, for those who have the opportunity to participate or witness, I think it's uh, probably the best time for a human being to see exactly uh, what nuclear weapon can do. And when you see those who have suffered the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki make a case for peace and security, make a case to ban nuclear weapon, you ask yourself, what are you doing? Are you doing enough? And when you see people like that saying that they feel unhappy that Japan is not ratifying the weapon ban treaty, you say to yourself, they might be right. But that's where this difficulty comes with the reality of the world, the reality of policy, the reality of multilateralism, and the experience that a citizen of a country can uh, live or have uh, suffered. So listening to the representative of the Ibakusha yesterday, I said to myself, can one go and tell a journalist that the weapon ban treaty is not timely, or that we have to go on a step-by-step -step approach. Because journalists will tell you, no, we want it now. We want it now, same as we want the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula now. But is it feasible? Can we achieve it now? Can we achieve a weapon ban now without the participation of the nuclear weapon countries? And I think that's the situation that Japan faces. Japan is facing a situation that they have worked with their ally, but they have the pressure with the civil society pressure from the Ibakusha that they should go in this movement. It's true, it's a noble cause. It's a noble goal that they want to achieve. But is it practical right now? One thing is to make a point. The other thing is to make sure the point you make can be achievable. And that's a difficulty that we're facing. And this is why I'm bringing in the CTBT as a key element to help move slowly or 
even faster if we fast enough in getting the CTBT ratified by all countries and enter into force to move towards banning nuclear weapons once and for all. So my answer to the journalists was, I still advocate for this step-by-step -step approach because we often say, let's finish what we started. We started many treaties. We started the CTBT. We're working on the NPT. We haven't achieved those. Let's try and finish them as we move towards achieving a nuclear weapon free world. And uh, the analogy that I'm using is, if you want a green city, if you don't want cars in an environment, you make sure that they don't manufacture a car next door. Because if they do manufacture a car, you will find it hard to stop people using them. And it's the same. If we have nuclear weapons that are in the making by nuclear testing, you will have them still. So let's stop nuclear weapon testing to help us stop nuclear weapons once and for all. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's a contribution that the CTBT can bring to the overall non-proliferation and disarmament framework. It's not easy, because as I say in my introductory remark, I say the CTBT seems to not be tangible anymore. The CTBT is not, I use the word sexy, because that's a word that uh, uh, Secretary Schultz uh, uh, used once when I was talking to him. He said, look, uh, Dr. Zerbo, your problem is that it's hard to explain to people what testing is all about. That's something that is difficult. Because it's hard to explain, it's hard to deal with. So, but we have to try. And you, the younger generation, you have to try and integrate nuclear testing in the nuclear weapon framework and then help us achieve uh, a world free from nuclear testing for a world free of nuclear weapons. So the value of the CTBT in uh, the DPRK context. Many have asked us why the CTBT wants to be involved in the denuclearization process of the, of the, uh, the Korean Peninsula. It's not that we want to be involved, and this is what I tell people. I'm not trying uh, to come for a photo opportunity at the border at the DMZ uh, to say that the CTBT exists. But when you talk about nuclear testing, what other organization exists on this planet that deal with nuclear weapon testing than the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty? Of course, we have this fine line between on-site inspection that only kicks in when the treaty enters into force, which is not the case and verify an agreement to which we can bring a wonderful contribution. We have a test site that is part of our remote monitoring for, as we do for all the planets. And then we have a test site that seems, or was, its closing was featured on TV. But what happened next? What expert is dealing with the closing of this test site? Who is verifying the closing of this test site? And what do we have? Of course, we have expertise and technology for on-site inspection. But expertise and technology for on-site inspection is not for the on-site inspection only in the context of the CTBT, but can be used to do site characterization, for instance, pre and after the closing of the test site, using ground penetrating radar, many other technology uh, that we can use to give a better understanding of what's happening on the ground that people can use and then say, yes, for sure, no movement is happening and the tunnel has been closed and then so forth. That's the contribution that we can bring. We're not saying that we want to lead the process of verification of the denuclearization, but we have to be part of it because we have some expertise that can be of great contribution to the overall process. And that's what we talk about. And if you don't talk about it in this context, where and when can you talk about the CTBT? Where and when can you make relevance for the CTBT? So we have to use every single opportunity to make a case for this treaty for its entry into force. And the best case here and the best case is the DPRK denuclearization process. If we don't, for technical reason, we have to do for the policy issue, which is getting the DPRK at least to be at the same level of the US in this negotiation, which is a signature of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. To that, I want to acknowledge uh, Anton Klopskov's effort. Uh, he's the only one to have organized or given us this opportunity to have an informal chat with North Korea. I think twice I met North Korean 
in, uh, in Moscow, uh, through Anton's Clubs of Conference. That was the only op opportunity that I had to exchange with them to understand where they come from, what they want, and why, for instance, they're not talking to us. And I can share something with you. In uh, multilateral diplomacy, before uh, this now positive sign of the inter-Korean discussion, as well as the Trump Yon, uh, Kim Jong-un summit, we were told, or we were made uh, to feel uneasy uh, with regard to any contact with the DPRK. To a point, when we were uh, celebrating, I don't know if it's celebrating or called the 20th anniversary of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, I was hesitant to invite the DPRK. Then I said to myself, I cannot be asked to promote the entering to force of the CTBT and not invite a country that has been so far uh, to the CTBT and so close because they're the only one to do nuclear testing. So I did send an invitation. Not that I was expecting them to come. But I wanted to make a case that we have open doors for them to come and join us and talk to us as we move towards putting an end to nuclear testing. But multilateral diplomacy is not that easy. That's why I can tell you it's much easier to be a scientist than to be a policymaker or a diplomat. So if you are both, uh, you can find a way to save yourself and then lean left when it suits you and then right when it does, which is what I'm doing right now. Uh, so when I want to say something that is not easy, I say that I'm a scientist. So when it's easy, I say that I'm a diplomat. Because diplomat can say anything. No, scientists can say anything, but diplomat can say a lot. And that's the beauty of science and diplomacy, and that's why you guys are so fortunate to be in this field. But if you want to make the best of science diplomacy, take the CTBT. Make sure whatever you do has the CTBT in it. I know you do it already, but don't forget this issue. Whatever you can, inject a dose of CTBT. I mean, many are talking about cybersecurity. There's one who is, uh, I think, you are an expert of cybersecurity, I guess. But come and talk to our cybersecurity expert in Vienna. And I'm talking about you, returning. Who is there? Julia. Yeah. yeah. Okay, come and join us and then talk about the CTBT, talk about the science, and then see how best uh, we can make uh, use of the expertise we have to make a case for this treaty to enter into force. So when I mention uh, the agreement, again, yesterday I was asked, but what can the CTBT do in the denuclearization? Of course, let's try to avoid this perception of competition between the IEA and the CTBT. No international organization is competing with the other. All international organizations have the use, have the reason to be, and they're there to complement each other for the good of the international community, for the good of peace and security. The IE has an important role, and the IE should have an important role in the democratization process of the Korean Peninsula. But I just want to separate things in, at three different levels. Short term, it was about closing the test site stopping nuclear weapon testing, and stopping missile launch. So, midterm, it's about stopping the enrichment of uranium and plutonium, and then longer term, it's about full denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. In the short term, the CTBT has a contribution to supplement what the IEA might be doing when we talk about stopping enrichment and then moving towards a complete denuclearization. In stopping nuclear testing, we have our role. In characterizing the site, we have our role. And that's where the CTPT can come in to complete what the IEA does. There's nothing that we do to substitute what the IEA would do, or could do, or should do. We just have a tiny little role to play that could have great consequences and positive consequences for the entry into force of the CTPT. And that's all what we're trying to do. I think, Sayil, I will uh, stop here and then let you, uh, let us go for questions. So I'm probably better at answering questions than talking. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to leave quite quickly to attend some bilateral